Okay, let's get started. So for those who don't know me yet, I'm Renzo Huber. I'm a visiting fellow postdoc order in the group from Peter Banditini here at NIH. And I'm happy to talk about uh, this title that was given to me, FMRI Methods and Applications at High Fields and High Resolutions, which is a pretty mighty talk title already. So we have a lot to talk about. And I interpret this title um, in the sense that I will talk about methods and applications with a, with a kind of exclusive end. So there will be some slides about applications and some about methods, as long as they are both referring to high fields and high resolutions with an inclusive end. So I will not about, talk about high resolution at low fields or low resolution at high fields. And since this is such a um, mighty title and a big field, I cannot really give you a very um, comprehensive overview in just 45 minutes. But luckily, there's a lot of material out there. And specifically, the Society of ISMRM collects a lot of videos um, with the focus on high resolution, high field MRI. For example, the 2014 annual meeting had a specific focus in the educational sessions and um, where you can watch most of the videos online. And also last year, they had this multi-day workshop specifically about high field and high resolutions. And some of the talks are open to the public. For some of them, you need a password. If you don't have one and need one, come and see me after this lecture. Siemens also organizes these um, ultra high field user meetings where they usually invite um, the group leaders of most of the high field sites. And those talks are kind of nice because there you get a very nice overview of what the people are doing without worrying too much about the technical side of things. If you're, however, interested in the more technical stuff, um, watch out my YouTube channel here where I try to collect both the more overview and the um, detailed talks. There are more and more high field scanners being installed all around the world. And with high field, I mean seven Tesla and higher. And to keep track of them, I made this open Google map that you are also invited to, to adapt and change and complete in case you know of a scanner that I might have missed. And you can see that we are approaching the number of 70 70s. And most of them are from Siemens in blue, quite a few are from Philips in orange, and also not too few are from, from GE in green. And the reason why 7 Tesla and high field strength are so popular and more and more scanners are being installed is that the signal to noise ratio increases super linearly with field strength. So in this example, you can see that going from 3 Tesla to 7 Tesla improves the signal to noise ratio in this flash example from 1000 to above 3000. And there are a lot of cool things you can do with this extra signal quality. And I think most people really um, trade it for high spatial resolutions. And additional to the improved signal quality at high field strength, also the contrast increases with field strength, as Peter already introduced on Monday. Especially susceptibility, like bold contrast methods, increase with field strength on top of the signal to noise ratio increase. The big challenges of high field, high resolution fMRI particularly are increased distortions, larger unwanted blurring during the EPI readout, higher susceptibility to artifacts like ghosting, the fact that not all the contrast mechanisms are as specific as we want them to be, and also the fact that the higher resolution require more data to be um, sampled, which takes longer time, so we need to have methods that speed things up. And all these challenges will be discussed and addressed in more detail in the second part of this lecture. And mostly people see them as part of life and, and deal with them in some sort and, and see them as like a small price to pay for the huge reward of high SNR and high resolutions. Because these high resolutions are really under high demand and very valuable for neuroscience, which I want to explain with this metaphor over here. So neuroscience bridges a whole regime and a big spectrum of different spatial scales. On the microscopic side, we have like DNA and neurons. On the more macroscopic side, we have behavior, manifestation of mental disorders, and activity across different brain areas. And it's this kind of mesoscopic part over here that is kind of underrepresented and under high demand. And I think both sides of the bridge try to, to close the gap, for example, with these very advanced optical, uh, optogenetic methods. You can measure hundreds and thousands of neurons at the same time functionally. And also with fMRI from this side of the bridge, high resolution fMRI, you can not only see activity across different brain areas, but also activity distributions within brain areas. And I think the keystone that will bring everything together is this spatial regime of 
few hundred micrometers, where we can start to see these basic functional building blocks of the cortex, namely these layers and columns. And my mouse is lost. Okay. And to give you an idea what kind of new information we can get by um, imaging these columns, I want to show you this example here where we are trying to um, investigate the neural representations of different sensory motor tasks. So for a conventional unilateral finger tapping with uh, conventional low resolution fMRI, we usually get these blobs of increased brain activity in the contralateral side of the hemisphere in the sensory motor areas. Now, when we want to look at the different subcomponents of this tapping task, we can, for example, modulate it and do the same tapping, but a bit slower, where you can see it's the same areas being involved, of course, and the overall activity is slightly reduced. Or we can modulate the task in the sense that we do a fast tapping, but leaving out the touch component here. And in this case, we get a very, very similar activity compared to the slow tapping the same areas and even a comparable signal strength can be seen here. So just looking at the brain images and the blobs that we get from those tasks, we cannot really say which one of the two tapping tasks has been done. It's not really easy to decode them. And we can also do the opposite kind of finger tapping and not doing the tapping without touch, but doing the touching without the tapping or doing the tapping with the other hand. And you can see that our level of interpretability is somewhat limited to these screwed features like number of blobs, size of blobs or location of blobs. So these blobs are kind of scary to me in the sense that they are much, much bigger than they should be and we are not really sure what they are made of. And I believe the way to go is to increase the resolution to 3, 2, 1, and submillimeter voxels. And at about 0.75 millimeter voxels, we start to see these striping patterns that you might be seeing on the screen as well. I think you can see them. And these striping patterns are very exciting for me because I believe they refer to different cortical layers. And when we do these kind of high resolution fMRI for all those different tasks, you can see that these stripes are differently modulated. So for some tasks like this one or that one, it's mostly the upper layer that is stronger activated. For other tasks like that one or that one, it's mostly the deeper ones that are strong activated. And um, these different stripes tell us something in the motor cortex about the input-output characteristics. So for example, in the primary motor cortex, we know that the deeper layers over here are the ones that have all these cortical spinal connections. So those are the ones that eventually triggers the muscles to move. While the upper layers up here are the ones that integrate a lot of input from other brain areas. So they receive a lot of cortical-cortical input. For example, for the tapping task, it might be motor planning area, premotor cortex, or a lot of feedback from sensory cortex that might be coming in here. And now, knowing this input-output features of the different layers at these high resolutions, we can start to distinguish these different tapping tasks that we could not distinguish at low resolutions. For example, for the slow tapping, we have a reduced output, so it's most of the activity is coming from the upper layer, as opposed to the fast tapping, where we have strong output in the deeper layers, but a reduced input from the sensory cortex because the touching is missing. So th this is the kind of information you, you, you hope to get from high-resolution layer-dependent fMRI, like input-output features, the kind of um, microcircuit level that is involved in certain tasks. And this is also, I think, a big motivator and reason why there are many, many more high-resolution, high-field studies published every year. And you can see that it took a while. So the first 10 years, maybe until 2010, it was rather flat. And I believe this is due to the fact that there are these um, increased levels of challenges that we will talk about in the second half. As soon as people got a handle on them, it really took off. And it's not only the methods papers in red, but it's also the neuroscience applications in blue here that are getting more and more. And I think in the last year, um, it's even more neuroscience, or at least those papers that I personally classified as neuroscience, that uh, took over compared to the methods papers. And the high popularity of high field, high resolution fMRI is also manifested in the fact that there are more and more special issues coming out. So I think just in the last one and a half years, there have been three special issues on that. One about high fields, one about high resolutions, and one particularly about lamina and columnar fMRI, which is also in, in my focus of interest. So let's look at those papers in specifically that deal about columns and lamina 
within those columns. And this is still an emerging field. There are about 150 uh, papers out there. And I try to keep track of all of them on this Twitter feed. And just in the last six months, I could count about 50 papers on that subject. And um, specifically about these ultra high field and um, ultra high resolution papers that deal with lamina and columnar um, interpretability. Most of it is really about methodology. Most of it is about contrast mechanisms, quite a bit about different readout methods. Also a bit on analysis methods. I hope there's coming more in the future. And like, less than 10% is about neuroscience. And since Peter gave me this title that I should talk about applications and neuroscience, I will now give you a whole list of different neuroscientific applications, and then we will talk about the methodology. The first papers that really um, convinced, I think, the community that high resolution makes sense is this study from S.A. Yacoub that you've see, seen now three times in three lectures. So Peter talked about this already. I will not go into too much details now. Uh, just as a reminder, um, they talked about different ocular dominance columns. So here the red and the blue stripes are referring to predominant um, responses for left and right eye. And at even higher resolutions, they could even see these orientation columns. And the ocular dominance um, patterns have been reproduced several times, and I think they have been even shown before, as I group, I think, from Ravi Menon's group. The orientation column results, however, have still not been reproduced because you need much, much higher resolution for that. Other applications at um, in visual cortex with high resolution fMRI is this one from Jonathan Polymeni, where he has this very fancy way of presenting stimuli in this pre-distorted way. So you know that uh, fovea is kind of overrepresented in the visual cortex, meaning that if you want to see a cross in the inflated brain, you need to kind of pre-distort that cross. And then within the inflated brain at the end, you kind of see the, the patterns that the people are seeing as well. And here in this animation, Jonathan is going through the different cortical depths, starting from the gray matter, white matter border, where you can see that it's mostly noisy and limited. Now you see it limited by SNR. If you have the middle cortical layers, you can nicely distinguish the cross. And in the upper cortical layers, close to um, CSF, you have these scrambled patterns because of all the large training veins, even though there you have the highest sensitivity. So by going through different cortical um, depths, you can choose your compromise of sensitivity versus specificity. Other applications in the visual cortex based on layer fMRI have been done, for example, by Peter Koch. And he tried to distinguish this input-output characteristics in the sense of having a feed-forward and feedback input in the primary visual cortex. And he had this stimulus where people are looking at these optical illusions. And depending on if you see a triangle or if you do not see a triangle, then he sees some input coming from the upper, from more cognitive areas. Um, and sending feedback into primary visual cortex, mostly in the deeper layers here, with an effect size of 0.1%. Lars Muckli had a similar study um, looking at contextual feedback, where he shows these images which have this occluded area. He, however, um, finds that it's mostly the upper cortical layers that have the higher um, classification accuracy, higher um, performance in the upper layers. So th those two papers are kind of contradicting, and it's not really sure if this is due to the different task or the different kind of methods and scanners or where it's coming from. High-resolution fMRI has also been applied in the sensory motor cortex. I think a lot of work has been pioneered from the Nottingham group, where they looked at the different digit representations um, along the central sulcus in the um, sensory cortex. Here you see the different gradients for the different fingers and all the different positions um, across the fingers can be seen in gradients perpendicular to that. And Witzke van der Zwar could even do some digit representation mapping in the very, very fine um, structures of the cerebellum. And just this morning I saw some fascinating results as well acquired here at NIH looking at different feedback in sensory cortex. Yeah. I think the first layer-dependent um, fMRI that has been done in the uh, motor cortex was done from Robert Trumpel, aka Slayer Robert. And he had this very um, cool task of doing not only a finger tapping, but also asking the people to imagine 
doing the finger tapping without actually moving the muscles. And in both cases, he actually does see a significant bolt signal increase. And also in both cases, across layers, he sees this kind of gradient of um, reduced activity across um, cortical depth. For the two different conditions, however, he sees a slightly different slope of this gradient. So he um, concludes that there might be a different input-output um, activity going on there. There has also been done some work in the auditory cortex, I think mostly pioneered from the Maastricht group, where they look at different um, predominance dominances for different auditory frequencies. And right on top of the Herschel trirus, you see that most of the columns are sensitive to low pitches, low ac acoustic frequencies, and going away from that, they shift towards predominantly and responding to high acoustic resonances. And they're also starting to do it now across different cortical layers, especially looking at the tuning width of different cortical columns and seeing how the tuning width changes based on attention across these different layers. And they're also pushing it further, further to more naturalistic sounds, for example, this cry of a seal baby here, where you see the, there's a very similar pattern that you have these low frequency dominances right on top of first gyrus and then these um, higher um, frequency sensitivities around that. A more cognitive example might be the study here looking at the number sense, where within this small part of the parental lobe, people seem to have this um, numerosity sensitivity. And if people see like different numbers of objects, it's mostly the lateral um, part here that is preferably um, responding to large numbers, while smaller numbers are more represented in the more medial parts here. And looking at all these um, fine scale patterns here obviously raises the question, which kind of resolution do we actually need to have to see those? So obviously if, if everything is blurred in a big blob, you don't see everything, anything because it's just averaged out. And the question, which kind of resolution do we actually need is also a question that Hendrik, sitting in the last row here, um, is interested in, also a postdoc at NIH. And um, I asked him about it and he sent me like 20 slides or so. So I believe that the um, answer to the question, which kind of resolution do we need is, is, is complicated. And it depends on a lot, a lot of things and there's not a single number. And I think that uh, um, it can be somewhat um, summarized by looking at this graph here, where he looks at the classification accuracy as a function of resolution, smoothness, and as a function of the ROI size. And in any case, he always sees this kind of inverted U shape, meaning that you can actually have a too high resolution. And uh, I uh, um, interpreted that as having too high noise levels at these high resolutions. And you can also have too low resolution where everything's just smooth away. Is that right, Hendrik? Cool. Okay, now that I talked about um, a few applications, um, I want to also talk about the challenges that we have to do high-resolution, high-field imaging. And there are quite a few. And since this um, lecture series, I believe, is specifically dedicated for summer students and post people who actually spend or should spend some time at the scanner, I try to include a few like real-life examples and, and will show you some of my personal strategies to account for these challenges that we will see. So the biggest challenge is the signal to noise, obviously, at high resolutions, which I want to explain with this short back of the envelope calculation here. So the signal to noise is dependent on the amount of magnetization we have available. So it is directly proportional to the voxel volume, aka the distance cubed. And this third power law is quite unfortunate because it means that going from a conventional 3 millimeter voxel to a desired 0.75 millimeter voxel is a reduction of a factor of 64, which is quite a number to deal with. So there's no question that we need to have advanced imaging readout methodology and also high field strength. And for me, high field strength is really the game changer. I'm particularly interested in blood volume fMRI, where at three Tesla, at three millimeter resolutions, I just barely exceed the detection threshold. While seven Tesla is a whole different world. You can go to open seven five millimeter resolutions and start to see these striping patterns. 
And you might even get high, more performance at 9.4 Tesla, but it also comes along with more and more challenges. And I think you can think of it in this way here, showing that three Tesla might be the most cost efficient way of doing fMRI. It's established, you press a button and it just works. While seven Tesla it might give you some extra performance if you're willing to put extra effort into it. And, but it's still it's established enough that it mostly just works. And this is not really true at 9.4 Tesla just yet, where you really need a whole team of engineers working on it, and even then you get one or maybe two successful experiments out of it every few days. Another big challenge of high-resolution fMRI is that the conventional functional contrast mechanisms are not as specific as we want them to be. In fact, if you simply turn up the resolution, you usually end up with the same unspecific blobs, and now you just have them in high resolution. And this feature is kind of well explained since the advent of fMRI and comes from the fact that most of the bold signal changes, referring to oxygenation changes within these large vessels that are not as nicely laminar aligned like the neurons are. And I believe you can think of it as, as this way that doing bold fMRI to do brain activity mapping is somewhat comparable as doing CO2 emission to measure the industrial activity. And it might work very well to compare different countries or to compare different cities, but it certainly breaks down as soon as you approach the spatial scale of the training infrastructure. And you can obviously not use the overall CO2 emission of that voxel here as an indication of the activity in this shop right here, because most of the CO2 emission refers to activity in other places. And similarly here, most of the oxygenation changes at this location refers to activity in other layers further upstream. And our approach to deal with these kind of specificity limitations is to use non-bold contrast mechanisms, for example, mechanisms that are more specific to the microvessels that are more um, closely aligned to the laminar neuron levels, for example, this blood volume sensitive laser method. But there are also other bold sensitive methods that have been hypothesized to have a higher specificity. And some of them have been introduced already from Peter on Monday, for example, the spin echo EPI, spin echo bold, T2 prep, T1 row prep, and diffusion weighted T2 prep, all of which have a difference a sensitivity to either large veins, small vessels, or large arteries. And to see which one of those methods is most suitable for our um, layer-dependent studies, we implemented all of them, where you can see the sequence diagram on the left and the corresponding contrast on the right. And doing a finger tapping, then you can see that um, they have a very different um, response characteristics. For example, the diffusion rate of T to prep here you almost don't see anything at all. You really need to know where to look for it. Other contrasts, like the Great Net Echo Bold, is much more sensitive, but it's kind of blobby. You don't really see these laminar structures that you might see, for example, in Vaso or in this Spin Echo EPI. And to summarize all these different contrasts, I tried to blot them here as a function of sensitivity versus specificity. There you see this kind of unfortunate result that it's basically following this line, where you can either be sensitive or be specific, but not really both at the same time. And the more sensitivity you want to have, the less specificity you get, and vice versa. The only kind of outlayer here might be this blood volume vaso method, which is the only non-bold contrast in this family, which is certainly not the most specific one and also not the most sensitive one, but it, I think, can kind of give you something you can work with. But VASO is also not the only non-bold fMRI contrast out there, and some of them has been introduced already on Monday from Peter, for example, blood flow measuring with this ASL method, which is a bit more noisy than VASO, but if you average for hours, then you can get these nice-looking images like that. And down here, I tried to plot the um, CBF changes as a function of cortical depth, and you can see that, similar like VASO, it is insensitive to these large training veins above the cortical surface, where bold has most of the um, signal changes from. And you can even go, go one step further and do mapping of CMRO2, the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, so the amount of oxygen that the uh, um, brain activity uh, comes along with. And doing that, we get similar results, uh, slightly the like, uh, independence of the large training veins in the very upper cortical layers, and we kind of see most of the activity, in this case for a, a motor cortex finger tapping, in layer 2-3. The additional challenges of 
and doing CMR2 mapping is that you need to have an additional calibration scan, meaning that you need to give your volunteers um, higher concentrations of CO2 to breathe, which not all of them like very well. And you also have quite a few biophysical model assumptions underlying that to get to these CMR2 um, results, and they still need to be kind of validated across cortical layers. Another contrast that might be promising is um, quantitative functional susceptibility mapping. And this is a slide I got from uh, Pina, also a postdoc at NIH. And she sees that in areas where you have a positive bolt for this kind of visual stimulus in, the, uh, in V1 or visual areas and in the motor areas for this motor task, that within those areas of positive um, bold, she sees these uh, bi-directional responses in the functional quantitative susceptibility mapping. So some of the voxels, like in orange here, have a positive response and some of them have a negative response, which is kind of interesting because it might tell us that there's some complementary information in quantitative susceptibility mapping compared to bold. And I believe it's not really established yet where these bidirectional responses are coming from, if it's a feature from the large training veins, if it's an, a feature of the um, evaluation pipeline to get to these um, quantitative susceptibility results, or if it's kind of an uncoupling between flow and volume. And Pina showed in her ISMRM talk recently that it's um, probably not the veins, because the positive and negative voxels here have a very similar um, tissue components compared to creating the bolt. So they, they are, don't have specifically a higher sensitivity to large training veins compared to bold. Another big challenge of um, high resolution fMRI is that it takes more time to acquire more data, more voxels. So there are methods that can speed up things, and one method that got a lot of attention that can speed up things is the simultaneous multi-slice, aka multi-band method, where you basically excite several slices at the same time, and for a conventional reconstruction um, pipeline you get these kind of images, where you kind of can see a brain, but it's overlaid with other slices that can interfere constructively or destructively, depending on the face of the slices. And then you can use the feature that these different slices here have different proximity to different coil elements. So here these circles refer to different RF channels that are usually stored within these helmet-like structures that people get when they're pushed into the scanner. And the different slices have different proximity to different coil elements. And you can use um, this to untangle these slices and then do fMRI with it and get high resolution results without sacrificing too much coverage. So here, for example, for a finger tapping blood volume method where you can already nicely separate motor from sensory cortex at about one millimeter resolution, while bold just starts to separate the two sides at this resolution. It's kind of more blobby. I personally found it very, very challenging to go much further than one millimeter with this kind of multiband SMS method. There are, however, other methods that can also do a similar um, acceleration along the set direction, such as this 3D EPI, which has been introduced pretty much at the same time as simultaneous multi-slice. However, it did not really get all this lobbying work from the Human Connectome project. So we tried to look also into 3D EPI. And as um, compared to the SMS part, where you excite um, the simultaneously um, where you look at the simultaneously acquired slices in a consecutive fashion, in 3D EPI you acquired a whole volume over and over again and just vary the different uh, spatial frequency weighting. And when you look at the um, signal quality as a function of voxel volume, here the TSNR, then you can see that in different spatial regimes, um, different methods seem to be better. At low resolution, like three millimeter conventional fMRI, um, we have a spatial regime where most of the signal fluctuations are actually coming from the sample, from the brain itself. And there, the SMS part seems to be better than the 3D EPI. At very, very high resolution, we are much more in the thermal noise dominated regime, meaning that most of the fluctuations are actually coming from the detector, from the scanner itself. And there, the 3D EPI seems to be better than the, the 2D SMS. And you can nicely distinguish these laminar patterns in the red 3D EPI compared to the blue SMS 2D EPI. Another very big challenge at high field, high resolution fMRI 
is the higher sensitivity to off resonance effects. And these, any kind of off resonance effects, are amplified at high field strength, which is kind of nice for bold imaging or quantitative susceptibility mapping or those kind of features, but it's kind of a challenge for EPI. So in EPI, when we want to acquire um, one slice of case space, we usually go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as soon as you approach um, matrix sizes and resolutions in the range of 1.5 to 1 millimeter, you, you get into a regime of switching rates, of switching back and forth, where um, most of the gradient coils that the high field scanners are equipped with a kind of resonate. So most of the energy you put into the gradient kind of builds up, accumulates, and, and the sequence gets very, very loud and shaky, and you have bigger eddy currents, which is challenging for EPI. Additionally to that, we also have different kind of um, gradient pulse shapes for high resolution. So for low resolution, we usually have these trapezoidal gradient shapes, meaning they ramp up, have a plateau, go down, plateau, up, plateau, and so on, associated with this going back and forth and back and forth. For high resolution, we are much, much more limited by the actually um, slew rate, by the switching rate. So most of the time, we actually um, being busy ramping them up. Only about 20% of the time, we have a plateau, and then um, going down again. And for most of this um, going up and down, it's also used for sampling. And this kind of more triangular gradient shapes make it very complicated for the conventional um, ghost corrections. So for example, um, if you have these kind of triangular shapes, any kind of delay of gradients can no longer be approximated with a global phase shift because every point in case space now would have a different phase shift for a constant delay. And I, um, to give you an idea what this means in terms of data quality, I tried to look at the same slice for different kind of switching rates and different kind of triangularness, if you want. And I used a resolution where you can just start to see layer features. Unfortunately, you cannot see them very well here because of this pen. Um, the take-home message here, now, I will first explain the data and then come to the take-home message. So you can see that for most of the switching rates, the ghost level seems kind of moderate in the signal domain. In the stability domain, the TSNR, you see that most of the times you actually do have up to 20% of ghost level. And it certainly really breaks down as soon as you have these higher bandwidths. And above a certain level, the ghosts are actually stronger than the an actual image you're interested in. And the take-home message here is that it makes a lot of sense to, um, if you see these ghosts, just wiggle around a bit with different kind of uh, gradient triangular shapes and different kind of um, echo spacings. And in fact, um, here um, we see larger ghosts if you have more trapezoidal gradients compared to the more triangular gradients. So here, this image and this image actually have the same echo spacing, uh, just a different kind of bandwidth, so a different kind of a time you use of sampling during um, these ramp up and down. Even more important than the phase errors in the actual EPI acquisition are the phase er errors during the calibration scans for, for the acceleration. And for I'm sure for any kind of high resolution, high field fMRI, you do some kind of acceleration in plane with these methods called crop power sense. And for very unfortunate reasons, the conventional approach to, approach to do these um, reference acquisitions is that you first acquire like every other line, and then one TR later, you acquire the missing lines. And the unfortunate fact comes in because there might be a lot of phase errors between the different uh, segment acquisitions. And if you look at, at a high-resolution image with that kind of um, acquisition scheme of the reference crapper data, it looks kind of like this. So it looks noisy, which kind of all the high-resolution fMRI data look like, but you also have these like um, signal leakage um, to other places, for example, even outside the brain. More appropriate approaches to acquire the reference data for, for the Krapa calibration would be, for example, acquire the lines in this kind of fashion, in a like flash kind of approach. And maybe you will hear about that more from Lalith also later in the summer course. Um, other approaches might be that you reorder the kind of looping you do these different segments. For example, acquire segments that are close to each other, very close in time as well, or also acquire these kind of reference scans in both directions with this dual polarity crapper regime, which you might be able to read. So uh, comparing the conventional to the flash approach, uh, flipping back and forth here can show you how much it really improves the data. 
So there, there's almost no disadvantage in doing that. And you, you get a lot of extra signal quality just for free. And most of these like signal that in the, in the outside of the brain is um, put back where it should be. So the take home message here is never ever use the conventional way of the Krupper um, reference line acquisition if you have the option. If you do not have the option, it makes a lot of sense to put extra attention um, to minimizing these phase um, inconsistencies. For example, it um, has been shown that it's um, helpful, for example, to include a fixation task during the first 20 seconds of your EPI acquisition because at the tiniest movement of the eyes might um, contaminate and... and um, yeah, screw up the uh, navigators um, of this slice, and then you don't only have screwed up eye uh, images, but also um, ghosts within the entire slice. For example, here, um, going down here, or if you do SMS, then you basically screw up the whole volume just because of a tiny eye movement in the first 20 seconds. Sometimes it also helps to include a breath holding task during the first 20 seconds. So when people do a deep breath during the um, reference scans, then these phase errors are uh, amplified by a lot. Sometimes it even helps to simply invert the phase encoding direction from AP to PA because then sometimes the uh, fat ghost is in places where um, it doesn't matter so much. Another very big limitation of high field, high resolution fMRI are so-called T2 star blurrings. And Peter talked about this already a bit. And this is particularly amplified at high resolution, high field fMRI um, for two reasons. High fields are challenging because the T2 star decay is much faster. And high resolution fMRI is particularly challenging because you have more data to acquire, so it takes longer to acquire your slices. And for a conventional full case-based gradient echo EPI acquisition, we have a lot of signal available for the first case space line, and most of it is decayed away until we get to the last case space lines. And since the different case space lines refer to different spatial frequencies, it all obviously affects the smoothness of the data at the end. And it also depends on the kind of trajectory or, or method you're using. So here, for example, in blue, a center out gradient echo EPI or a, a spin echo EPI would look much more like that. And the math to describe this kind of effective resulting blurring has been out there for quite a while, usually in, by means of this magnitude point spread function. And this magnitude point spread function can be understood as a, a response of an imaging system to a point source. And people usually assume linearity in the imaging system, so you can approximate the blurriness of the image by convolving the point spread function with the object. And the assumption of the linearity comes about assuming that um, if you have two different point sources and blurring them, um, and separately, you have the same results if you, as if you would have two point spreads, uh, two point sources together and blur them. And the results of the point spread functions for those two kind of trajectories are visible here. And you can see that for the full case space acquisition in red, you have much more blurring compared to the ones in blue, which has a sharper point spread function. Personally, however, I have issues with this kind of simplified models because I believe that an fMRI is not really a linear system. You're mostly looking at the magnitude, which does not really follow this distributive property. And in fact, we actually do have an imaginary part from the fact that this red line here is asymmetric in case space. Meaning that actually neighboring voxels can also have some um, destructive interference. And as soon as we add up a, a finite background to our point source, then the, the point spread functions look very, very different. So in fact, the red line might have these negative side lobes over here. But let's let the data speak for itself. So here I'm showing you a full case space acquisition and a half case space acquisition. And uh, it's a bit dark, I apologize for that. And you can see flipping back and forth that the full case space acquisition, the red line, is much, much crisper compared to the half case space acquisition, which is much blurrier in the phase encoding direction AP here. Similarly, for functional data, here looking at the sensory motor cortex during a finger tapping where I have phase encoding direction left, right, you can see that for a full case space acquisition, you see this dark line. Can you see it? I think you can see it, uh, which refers, for example, to a layer four in primary sensory cortex. And for the half case space acquisition, it's completely blurred away. Even though for the conventional magnitude point spread function, um, it actually suggests that the 
and blue line here should be sharper compared to the red line, but the data tell us the opposite, because we actually do have this imaginary part. And you obviously then, in the full case space, referring to the red line here, we also see nicer laminar structures in the functional results. So the take-home message here is that don't worry too much about these magnitude points but functions. They are not really saying so much about the um, resulting resolution in the final EPI images. And don't be too much afraid of long echo times. And never ever really make too big compromises with respect to the echo time, for example, to, in order to switch it to a center out acquisition scheme in a kind of partial Fourier way. The last big challenge I will talk about are increased distortions, which also comes from the fact that we have higher off-resonance effects at high resolutions, especially in areas that are hard to shim here as seen in these field maps. And the big challenge of um, um, high fields is that, uh, like here, the gray matter is not only uh, moved by a few layers, but sometimes gray matter is, is completely outside the area it should be. And for very high resolution fMRI, distortion correction is not really an option because it um, involves an additional spatial resampling step. And here, Polymeni and colleagues could show that just the one single um, step of doing distortion correction can basically uh, double the effective resolution. I mean, double the effective voxel size that you have at the end. So we should not really do um, distortion correction if we are interested in these very, very fine scale features. And the way how we try to deal with it is that we forget about these anatomical spaces, MP2 rich or MP rich images, and do everything in EPI space with the exactly distortion matched anatomy and also do the segmentation and layering in EPI space. And the way how we do this is that we um, use an inversion recovery EPI sequence. So we invert all the magnetization in the brain and acquire one image shortly after that with SMS to get a decent coverage. And then um, 1.5 seconds later, we acquire the same volume um, with a different T1 weighting. So every three seconds, we have two pairs of volumes here which have a different T1 weighting. And then we can use them and just push them through an MP2 rich like Bloch model and end up with quantitative T1 maps that have the identical distortions as the um, EPI data. And I believe that here you can nicely see the contrast to noise ratio between gray matter and white matter or gray matter and CSF that is enough to get a good segmentation and layerings as well. So in conclusion, high resolution, high field fMRI is, is super fun. And we get a lot of um, valuable information, for example, about feed forward feedback, about input output, about the microcircuitry involved in certain tasks. However, it comes along with a lot of challenges, such as limited signal to noise, um, longer read durations that needed to be uh, speeded up. And we have unwanted blurring. We have unspecific contrast mechanisms increased sensitivity to um, ghostings and also in larger distortion levels. And only if you can account for all of these challenges, then you get, a, get to a nice data that you can use for neuroscientific interpretations. And with that, I thank all my colleagues and you for your attention. Are there any questions? Yes, Okay. I'm supposed to repeat a question for the mic. Um, so Isan asked about um, limits in the temporal resolution at high fields. And I'm not 100% sure if I get it correctly. Like, um, that the increased SNR that we, we, we get at very high field strength can be traded for, for anything. You can use it for higher acceleration factors, for example, more grappa, more SMS, which reduces your TR, and then you have effectively a higher resolution at the end. Um, um, with respect to um, if the higher 
field strength um, have some conceptual limits in temporal resolution, I'm not sure. So we are and with this, um, kind of doing vascular based fMRI, we are m mostly limited by the um, physiological like the um, hemodynamic response function in terms of resolution. So um, that the higher resolution um, people usually go for at like um, high field strength or with advanced acceleration are usually um, not really to, to sample the, the neural activity faster, but to get rid of unwanted stuff like, um, for example, cardiac induced or physiological noise that you can filter out easier. For um, like my focus of um, um, very high resolution, um, spatial high resolution imaging, like to, to get to these layers, I think that we shouldn't worry about too much about the temporal resolution. So I'm um, super happy to make compromises in like coverage or, or temporal resolution because I believe we really need to close the bridge over here. And, and as soon as everything's stable, we can um, build on top of that and push it further. But um, we first need to get something at all no matter um, how the temporal resolution is. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then thank you very much.